So back from our digression to talk about projections, let's talk about the feasible region of a linear program. So um, what I have drawn up on the left here is a set of linear constraints. We won't worry about an objective function. We'll just talk about the constraint region of the linear program. Um, we know that each individual inequality defines a half space and that for a point to be feasible, it has to um, fall into every single one of those half spaces. Every single constraint must hold. And that means, as we saw earlier, that the feasible region will be a convex set. Now, in two dimensions, as is the case here, in the event where the feasible region is bounded, so in two dimensions, I will define that to mean that it has a finite area. In the event where the feasible region is bounded, we get something called a convex polygon, which I think is something you probably have seen a lot of times before. So a convex polygon would be a convex region defined by a sequence of line segments that comprise its boundary um, and have and be closed, so it'll have a finite area. Um, it's worth considering. It's completely valid for a linear program to not have a closed feasible region. That doesn't actually necessarily um, uh, preclude this linear program having an optimal solution. So there are plenty of valid linear programs with an optimal solution whose feasible region is unbounded, uh, where in two dimensions you'd characterize that as having an infinite area. Formally, um, we would call such a shape, this set would be what's called a convex polyhedron. Um, and maybe it makes sense. We do think of the word polygon as meaning some closed shape. So polyhedron is the general term. Now, uh, that said, I'll talk about the three-dimensional case in a minute. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to necessarily always say polyhedron when I might mean it, and I'll, I'll justify that in a minute. Um, it's possible that we end up with a set of constraints where the intersection is actually empty. So if for some reason, you know, one, one constraint contradicts the others or something, and it's basically impossible to have a point that meets all of them. So if you look at, if you take apart these three constraints here, you might notice, okay, so x has to be at least three, y has to be at least four, but for some, but somehow I have to get x plus y to be less than or equal to six. And maybe you can see that's impossible. If x is at least three and y is at least four, the sum has to be at least seven. So there's no, there's no point that would meet all three of these constraints. Of course, that means that the feasible region is empty, so we can't really, there's no point in drawing it on the diagram. Um, formally, that's still a convex set. The intersection of these three convex sets is the empty set, which is a convex set. So we still have a convex set in any case. Obviously here, the linear program using these constraints has no solution. We, we would call such a linear program infeasible. There are no feasible points, so it's, it doesn't make sense to talk about optimal solutions. Um, it turns out, strangely, that in a lot of ways, the real difficulty of solving a linear program is actually finding feasible points. It's deciding if the constraint region is empty or not. Um, I know that sounds bizarre, given that we think of a linear program as some sort of interplay of constraints and uh, objective function, but we'll see later in the course that the constraints really do run the show, and that later we'll be able to write out, if you give me any linear program, regardless of how complicated, I can rewrite it as a different linear program whose objective function is basically trivial. So I can move all of the complexity into the constraint systems. And so it shouldn't surprise us that the constraint system and, and trying to understand what, what it means can be quite a big deal in this course. So we'll come back to that. We'll see that again. There'll be a, a nightmarish assignment exercise about that in mid-June or so. Um, oh, yeah, sorry. Th this, this, uh, this parenthetical is referring to that nightmarish exercise. Um, so let's think about 3D now. So suppose I'm working in three dimensions or in, in any higher number of dimensions. The set of points which satisfy a system of linear constraints, um, if the, the set is bounded, so in three dimensions we think about that as having a finite volume, then we get something called a convex polytope. And you can see my three-dimensional rendering of a convex polytope here, um, where each face of the polytope, each facet or face in three dimensions, is a plane, is which would be the boundary of one of the half spaces defined by a constraint. And because in this case, the shape that I get is fully bounded, it is what's called a convex polytope. Um, it turns out if we have an unbounded one, so in three dimensions that's completely possible, where one of, suppose the back wall of this shape were missing, the shape would then carry off into infinity this way. That's fine. That's valid in a linear program. Formally, some sources define polytope 
uh, in a way where it has to be bounded. So it has to be closed and have a finite volume to be called a polytope. Some sources will only use the word polyhedron in cases where we have an unbounded shape. Um, I am going to use the two terms interchangeably, but I will not always say convex. So I will pretty much always, when I say interchangeably, I'm being too diplomatic, I will always say polytope. I will ask questions like, even without a visualization, I'll say, here's a linear program, or here are a bunch of constraints. Let's talk about the polytope. Even if I, I don't know whether it's empty or unbounded, I will always say polytope. Now, to be fair, I have some ground to stand on there because some sources don't have this distinction. They don't, they don't define a polytope to only be closed or bounded. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to um, adhere to that school of thought. I'm just going to say polytope for everything. However, whether I say polytope or polyhedron, I will probably not use the word convex. If I use the word polytope in this course, you should assume I mean convex. So unless I explicitly say that it isn't convex, if I use the word polytope, you should assume that I also said the word convex. Um, yep, yeah, there, yeah, good. And that includes on an exam. So if on an exam, for some reason, um, my omission of the word convex changes your answer, that is your responsibility. Uh, obviously, you can always ask me a question during the exam if you need a clarification. Um, so first, first property. Uh, if in any number of dimensions, if I consider the polytope produced by a finite number of constraints, so, you know, like what I'd see in a linear program, there are a finite number of faces, or more generally facets, so here's a face, a finite number of edges and a finite number of vertices. There could be zero. Remember that I could have a set of constraints that defines the empty set as the feasible region. So there could be, and that, that has zero facets and zero edges and zero vertices. But if there are any edges, faces, or vertices, there will not be an infinite number. There is no way to construct an infinite number of intersections um, out of a finite number of linear constraints. That isn't true of other types of constraints. There are nonlinear constraints um, I could use as a thought experiment, consider some trigonometric functions that interact in some strange way. If I consider the different, these two functions, there are an infinite number of intersection points between them. Um, and if I, I were to define some set of all points between the two curves, I might end up with a bunch of disconnected regions that look sort of like this, where there would, there would be an infinite number of vertices. That is not so for linear constraints. There will be a finite number if I had a finite number of constraints. So why do we care about that? Well, we're building to a pretty powerful point here. Um, there is a point we're going to make in a few minutes that is that, that underpins most of this course, where none of what we're about to do for this course would make any sense without this point. And what it comes down to is that the vertices of the polytope are where all the action is. And that, in a sense, that means we don't have to care about anything else. Um, and that will affect dramatically how we search for our optimal solution. But one of the steps we have to take on the road to that point is to demonstrate that the number of vertices can be kept under control. There could be a large number of vertices, but if I have a finite number of constraints, there are a finite number of vertices. Now, that said, there could be a large finite number of vertices. So suppose I have a uh, linear program with n variables, so that is to say it's, it's over um, Rn, and big O of n constraints. I'm going to use 2n in my example. I could have 2 to the n vertices. So, so the number of vertices could increase exponentially with the number of constraints. Um, I actually have a pretty easy example for that. So let's minimize 1. That's, a, that's an easy one. Let's minimize 1 subject to the constraint that uh, each of my variables in n dimensions, xi, is greater than 0 and less than or equal to 1. So it's a trivial objective function. And we'll see later that if you have an LP of this form, either it has, either every feasible point is an optimal solution or there are no feasible points. There's no issue of where the maximum is. If I can find the feasible region, if it's non-empty, then the maximum or minimum is just every point in it. Um, so simple constraints, there are two n of them. So there are n constraints for forcing each variable to be non-negative, and there are n constraints forcing each variable to be less than or equal to one. If I draw that out in two dimensions, I get a square with four vertices. So I have two constraints, uh, or sorry, I have four constraints and four vertices. n equals two, and I have four vertices. If I draw it in three dimensions, I have um, n equals three, which means I've got six constraints, and I have eight vertices. And maybe you can see, I, I, I don't know how I would draw it in four dimensions, but this system in general describes a cube. It describes a hypercube in n dimensions. And it will have two to the n vertices um, if I work in n dimensions, even though I only have two times n constraints. So this is a, an example that, that constructively shows that the number of vertices can be very large. 
um, for a particular uh, number of dimensions. It's not proving that there won't be any more vertices. I could actually create more, I guess, in some cases, but um, it definitely establishes that there could be two to the n. Um, and just, yeah, to clarify, if I'm looking, if I'm working in n dimensions, every point, uh, if I choose values between 0 and 1 and I just, I assign them, so x1 equals 0, x2 equals 1, x3 equals 0, um, every uh, binary vector of uh, length n would be a vertex of such a, a system. And so that would, that would mean there's two to the n vertices. So we've hopefully seen enough by now. I hope that at this point in the lecture, having drawn out those feasible regions for various uh, constraint systems, when, when we talk about linear programs in two or three dimensions at least, we might be able to visualize what the feasible region looks like, this convex polytope floating in space. Um, what I want to talk about now is, okay, so it's a convex polytope, but where's the maximum or minimum? We know what the feasible region looks like, but what does it mean to find the optimal solution in that feasible region? So to do this, I'm going to try a little algorithm. I'm going to use a very simple optimization algorithm to wander around the inside of the feasible region and look for maximum points. Um, formally, the algorithm I'm going to use is a very basic, it's sort of gradient ascent. It's a basic example of an interior point method. Interior point methods are something that would not normally be covered in a course like this because they're very complicated. And in general, interior point methods are complicated. The ones I'm going to use are going to look simple, but it's because uh, I have a diagram I can draw on. Mathematically, it's not as obvious as what I might be doing. But the goal of, of this is to prove a point, not necessarily to, to demonstrate what interior point methods do. Um, what I want to prove is that what I want to at least show, I guess I can't write a proof today. What I want to at least demonstrate is that if I have this feasible region that is some convex polytope, so there's some convex polytope, almost nowhere in this feasible region is actually interesting to me. In a linear program, the interesting parts of this feasible region are very limited. They're probably the corners and that's it. And so I want to build to that point. That is the important point that I mentioned a few minutes ago. This big deal that it turns out really all we care about are the vertices of the feasible region, if we play our cards correctly. So it, this actually later, uh, quite a bit later, so probably after the first midterm, will form part of, I'd say the biggest part of, what's called the fundamental theorem of linear programming, which will finally cement all of the work we've done. When we get to the fundamental theorem of linear programming, it will allow us to heave that sigh of relief that all the stuff we've been doing actually has some solid theoretical basis. Um, we're going to get, work our way to the fundamental theorem of linear programming by first developing what's called the simplex method, which is a way of solving LPs. We'll discover that we can actually use the simplex method, an algorithm, as part of the proof to this fundamental theorem, which is a sort of interesting development. So here's a linear program. Um, and I want to maximize this subject to all of these constraints. Um, and I should add that while we're talking about linear programs, so OK, here's my objective function f. So we'll call that, let's say, equals f of x, y. Um, and if we want to apply some of the insight from the previous lectures, I might want to ask questions like, what is the gradient of f? So, OK, so f of x, y equals negative x plus 3y. This is, in fact, the, the, one of the functions we saw earlier. And so what is its gradient? Well, let's see. Let's take the partial derivative with respect to each variable. Well, the partial derivative with respect to x, well, we'll ignore the 3y, it's just negative 1. And the partial derivative with respect to y is just 3. Well, that looks familiar. That looks exactly like what I would do to pull out the normal vector from the description of a half space. For example, here's a constraint. What's its normal vector? Well, negative 1 comma 9. You just yank out the coefficients. Strangely, and actually turns out not so strangely because of the strange interplay between objective function and constraint, it turns out that if I want the gradient vector of my objective function, I just pull out all the, the uh, coefficients and that's it. So it's a linear function and so the gradient will be a constant vector. So the gradient is the same everywhere. At any particular point, I, I'm looking at exactly the same gradient. So, okay, let's state that in more general terms. If I have some linear function, which is a linear combination of my optimization variables plus some constant, the gradient will just be the coefficient of each uh, optimization variable. That's it. So the, the gradient is now very easy to compute. Um, and you can that's exposed a bit more if you write the function in vector notation. So if I write f of x to be c dot x plus d, 
then I notice if I take the derivative of that with respect to the vector x, then I get the vector c. So that there you go. It's maybe cleaner to write it that way, but we should see it both ways. So the gradient of f at each, at each point will just be the coefficients of the optimization variables. Here is the feasible region. It is a convex polygon with six edges, one edge for each constraint, uh, and one fact that we'll, we'll circle around a few times before we, we talk about it much more formally is that if I have uh, a particular number m of constraints, the number of facets of my uh, feasible region will be at most m. So each constraint can contribute at most one line segment to the side of my convex polygon in two dimensions. It's possible, though, if I have um, six constraints, I could end up with a convex polygon with only five edges. So the reason that would happen is, what if one of the uh, half spaces I'm working with is superseded? So what if one of my constraints is every point has to be on this side of that line? Well, you can see that for whatever reason, other constraints are more strict and they rule out some of the points um, between the, the boundary of the first half space and the polygon. So it's possible that if I have m constraints, my convex region, my, my feasible region has less than m facets because one of the constraints, one or more of them could be superseded by other ones. Um, oh yeah, okay, that's what I just said. So here's a contour plot for the uh, objective function. And we can, if we glance at this, we might notice that, okay, the minimum with respect to this region seems to be happening down here. The maximum seems to be happening up here. I want to get to that point without having a plot to stare at. I mean, we're cheating in a sense. If I plot out the function, I've done a whole bunch of work to make the plot. I shouldn't just you know, glance at this. I want to see if I can arrive at that conclusion by starting somewhere and just you know, using deduction or investigating what the function is doing at each step. Um, so I want to start at this point here, which is a feasible point, 2 comma 1. I want to just use the gradient to find the maximum value of f. To do that, I'm going to remove the gradient from my, I'm not going to plot the objective function anymore because I feel like having these contour lines is allowing, allows us to know a little bit too much. So let's start with this. I know what my feasible region is, um, and um, I just want to find the maximum starting here. And what I'm doing is, a in a sense, what an interior point method would do. It starts in the middle of my feasible region and then works its way to the maximum, although the way it's going to do that is a bit non-traditional. Most interior point methods don't want to go slam into the boundary as quickly as what I'm going to do. So what I could do is I could say, well, here I am in the middle of my feasible region. I want to find the maximum. Where can I go from here? Well, we know the way gradients work. If this is grad f, the gradient of f, if I'm looking for the maximum, the gradient of f tells me which direction should I walk if I want the objective function to increase a bit. So I think, well, I'm standing here. I will walk in the direction of gradient f. Now, unlike um, nonlinear problems, the gradient of f is actually constant. So no matter where I look, the gradient of f is going to be exactly the same, which means really it, the gradient of f isn't going to change as I keep walking in this direction. So I'll just keep walking until I can't. If I want to find a solution that's better than this one here, I will just walk along the gradient of f until somebody stops me. In this case, I'm going to walk along the gradient of f until I hit this wall, because I know that I can't leave my feasible region. Um, and that brings us to claim number one. So eventually I'm going to hit this wall here, but I, I guess I want to walk backwards and talk about claim number one. Claim number one, it is impossible for the optimal solution to only occur at an interior point. And the reasoning has to do with what I've just drawn, which is if I'm standing at some interior point, the gradient of f is constant. And if the gradient of f points over here, it means there is somewhere I can go that takes me to a larger value of f. Okay, and if I keep applying that logic over and over again, there's somewhere I can go, okay, that takes me here, and then that takes me here, and then that takes, eventually I'm going to keep moving until I hit a wall. So if I'm standing at an interior point, if the gradient is non-zero, there will always be somewhere I can go where the function gets bigger. And if I keep applying that logic, recursively I guess, I will eventually hit a boundary point. So in that case, where the gradient is non-zero, the minimum or maximum will not occur strictly at the interior points of the feasible region. Um, this slide is pointing that out for both maximum and minimum. So for a maximum, I would walk along gradient f. If I want to get, make the function smaller, I would walk along the negative of gradient f. So in, in both cases, uh, I would have some direction to move. The only situation where the interior point would be the maximum, so it is possible for an interior point to be the maximum, but only if every other point is the maximum too. So when would this point be the maximum? Well, it's only if the gradient doesn't give me somewhere to go to make the function bigger. 
But if the gradient is non-zero, then it will give me somewhere to go. So I guess there is the case, what if the gradient of f equals zero? We know that is the criteria for a minimum or maximum to exist. For We saw in the previous lecture, an interior point is a minimum or maximum if the gradient of f equals zero. So could that happen with a linear function? Well, absolutely. If we scroll back to looking at the definition of the gradient, the gradient is just the set of all the coefficients on the variables. So if the gradient is zero, if this equals zero, then every one of these equals zero, which means that every one of them equals zero. So all of these terms are zero, which means that f of x is, or f of uh, x1 through xn is just a constant. So if my function is a constant function, then the gradient equals zero. But more importantly, the gradient equals zero everywhere. So if I go back over to, uh, to here, it's possible if the gradient of f equals zero that this point is a minimum or maximum. But if the gradient of f equals zero, that means that f of x is just a constant, which means it has exactly the same value everywhere. So yes, this is the maximum, but so is this up here, and so is this, and so is this, and so is this, and so is this. And that means, in general, there will be a boundary point equal to my minimum or maximum. So there will never be a case, according to claim number one, where the uh, optimal solution, minimum or maximum, occurs only at an interior point. It might occur at an interior point, but if it does, it will also occur at some boundary point. That's claim number one. That's a big deal. And if you think about it, that means if we're trying to optimize linear functions, the entire interior of the uh, feasible region is now irrelevant to us. If we know that the, that the minimum or maximum will always occur somewhere along the boundary, we can now ignore every single point on the inside of the feasible region. That, and if you think about it, we have ruled out a lot of the search space. Okay, so let's continue our traversal. So we started at this feasible point here, and I walked along in the direction of gradient f until I hit a wall. And we know that there's no point in staying in the interior because any maximum or minimum will occur on the boundary. So I walk along until I hit a wall, and then I ask the question, am I done? So is this, this wall I hit, is this the optimal solution? And it, we have to think a bit before we can answer that question. So when, I'm hitting, when I hit that wall, I was up against a constraint. It's, it's this half space here. Um, this vector, this yellow vector, is the normal vector. Whoops, that's not very parallel. This yellow vector is the normal vector of that half space. And uh, here in red is grad f. So I know that I can't just walk in the direction of gradient f, because that would take me outside of my feasible region. We also might remember that uh, what we talked about in the last lecture, these, those KKT conditions, they actually do apply to linear programs. We didn't want to go into too much detail then, um, but one of the conditions was you were at the maximum. If there's only one constraint, you should expect the gradient of f to be parallel to the gradient of the constraint. And this normal vector is the gradient of my constraint function at that point. And so um, it turns out that doesn't hold. I'll come back to that in a couple of minutes. The question is, is there any direction I can walk that would improve the function value? Um, and what I'm asking is, I guess I can't walk in the direction of grad f, but is there some similar direction I can go in? Is there any direction that is broadly in the same sort of hemisphere as grad f? In other words, any vector where grad f, any vector v where grad f dot v is greater than zero. And the answer is, well, yeah, I could walk along the boundary. I could hug the boundary. If I walk along the boundary, I'm not walking directly in the direction of grad f, but I'm walking broadly in the same direction. So again, um, if I walk in this direction d, then grad f dot d will be greater than 0, because the minimum angle between them is less than 90. And that means I will be increasing my function value, just not as fast as I would be increasing it by walking directly in the direction grad f. So what I can do is I can project my, my, my vector grad f onto the boundary segment. Uh, and the way I do that is by using the normal vector. So as I discussed in the interlude earlier about projections, I can use the normal vector of this half space to project things onto the line of the boundary. And so I do that. So I get this vector. So sorry that the diagram doesn't have labels. Um, I get this vector uh, d. And then I walk along in direction D as far as I possibly can go. And of course, that's going to take me to this corner here. I'm going to hit another wall if I keep walking in that direction. So I end up at this vertex of the polytope. And now I ask the question again, am I done? Have I found the maximum solution? So at this vertex, I am standing at the junction of two different uh, half spaces. i got to get a ruler or something. Um, it feels there's something strangely postmodern about drawing on a screen but needing an actual ruler to draw. Um, okay, so I'm at the intersection of these two constraints. 
I'm at that vertex uh, that is their intersection. If I take a look at the, there's grad F again, and here are the gradients of the two constraints that are active at this point. So of course, there are lots of constraints in my system, but this point is the intersection of two of them. The other constraints are all slack. They're all um, not operative. I'm, I'm well inside of the boundary of every other constraint. Okay, so I have these two constraints. I look at their gradients. And we remember again that intuitive condition from last time that I'm at the maximum if the gradient of F lies between the gradients of the two constraints. In this case, it doesn't. And what that's actually telling us, really, is that there is a direction I can walk that is still feasible um, that will increase f. So let's take a look at the hemisphere. So I want to find whether there's a direction I can walk where the dot product of my direction and the gradient of f is greater than zero. In other words, is there an angle less than 90 degrees that I can turn away from f that I can still walk and still be feasible? And the answer is yes. If I project f onto this boundary segment, I get a vector that still in points broadly in the same direction as f. So if I walk along it, I will still be increasing my objective value. And so I do the same thing I did before. I project f, a grad f, onto the edge of my feasible region. And I can do that by using the gradient, um, sorry, the normal vector of that constraint. And I get this vector d again, and then I keep walking. And then I hit this point. I hit the intersection of these two constraints. And I ask the question again. And it turns out in this case, if I actually produce, it's hard to, the diagram makes it a bit hard to see, but um, this essentially here is the line perpendicular to grad f. Um, we'll notice that the two gradients of the constraints that are operative lie sort of around grad f. Grad f lies between those two things. Grad f is a positive linear combination of those two vectors. It turns out that that's actually the KKT condition. That means that I'm at the optimal solution. But I can also see that geometrically. Because if I try and walk along the boundary segment, it makes sense I wouldn't want to walk back this way. Obviously, I just came from there. If I walk this way along this boundary segment, that direction is more than 90 degrees away from grad f. So if I walk that way, the function value will decrease slightly, which means there's nowhere for me to go. I'm stuck at this vertex. I'm stuck in this corner here, and I can't make the function any larger. And the KKT conditions give us a theoretical way of verifying this, but it turns out that I am now at the optimal solution. This is the optimal solution to the LP. It's at a corner. And moreover, if I look at what I did there, so I walked from an interior point to an edge, and I was able to verify on the way there that all of the other interior points are irrelevant to me. The maximum has to occur along the boundary. So I walked to an edge. And then when I was on the edge, I walked over to a corner. And then I walked from one corner to another, and then I decided I was at an optimal solution. That takes us to claim two. This is an outrageous claim. This is saying a huge amount. This is saying if I have a linear program that is feasible, so it's saying bounded here. It turns out this actually applies uh, depending on how I interpret the word bounded. Um, it, it, it's not saying that uh, the polytope has to be um, closed. It's saying that the LP can't just go to infinity. If there were an edge, for example, if I was allowed to just go off into infinity this way, then I could make the objective function as big as I want. If I have a linear program that has an optimal solution, so it has feasible points, it doesn't go to infinity, then that optimal solution will always occur at some vertex of the polytope. It may occur elsewhere. For example, if the, function is if the objective function is constant, it may occur everywhere. Who cares, though? It'll always occur at a vertex, among other places. This is a really, really big deal. Because what it means is that we no longer care about anything other than vertices. We don't care about the edges. We don't care about the interior points. Um, and given the fact that we saw earlier that if I have a finite number of constraints, there are a finite number of vertices, what claim two is actually telling us is that we can turn what appears to be an optimization problem in real numbers, a continuous problem, we can turn that into a discrete search. If the optimal solution is going to occur at a vertex and there are a finite number of vertices, I could just look at every vertex. That's it. I can solve this continuous problem by just looking at this finite number of things. It's true, it could be a huge finite number. There could be two to the n vertices. But I have managed to convert what appears to be a continuous problem into a discrete problem. And this also means I don't have to worry about using some numerical approximation that has to 
converge towards an optimal solution eventually. As long as I can find the vertices exactly, I will find the exact solution to this problem by just iterating over the vertices. There's no issue about waiting for some convergence to occur or putting up with some approximation. Um, so we can't justify the claim just yet. We've got a couple of loose ends to tie up. This is a big deal, though. We need this claim, which is a, the core of the fundamental theorem of linear programming. We need this claim for everything we're going to cover between now and the fundamental theorem of linear programming. Here are the loose ends we have to tie up. We've already tied up some of them, but not all of them. The biggest loose end is, is there a vertex? Because obviously, if we're claiming that there's always that our maximum will always occur at a vertex, it's a bit of a tough claim to make if there are no vertices. So the first observation is it is possible to construct LPs where there are no vertices at all. Um, and an example of that would be minimize x such that um, x is greater than 5. And if we, it, well, yeah, if we do something like this in two dimensions or, or one dimension or something, actually, I guess we should do it, let's do minimize x plus y such that x is greater than 5. And um, hmm, actually, I, I, I have to be careful about this. It's hard to construct one of these examples in only one or two dimensions. If I consider this to be a two-dimensional problem, you might see what, what I end up with is I'm just inside some half space and that's it the half space never intersects anything else and there's no vertices. So it's possible, sorry for not constructing a more convincing example, but it's possible to construct LPs with no vertices whatsoever, but which do have an optimal solution. So that one I just erased does have an optimal solution. Minimize x such that x is greater than or equal to five. Well, yeah, five is the solution. Um, We'll see in the next lecture that what we can do is transform the LP, add a couple of extra constraints, maybe a couple of extra variables to force it to have vertices. If we do that, then we've taken care of this issue. So we'll do that in the next lecture. We'll define what's called a standard form for linear programs that requires every uh, variable to be positive and or to be non-negative. It can be zero or positive. And obviously that's a pretty dramatic constraint to impose. We'll see that there is a way of doing that for every linear program without changing the character of the linear program. The next one, which we've already gone over to some extent, is if the optimal solution occurs at an interior point, for claim two to be true, the optimal solution also has to occur at a vertex. Um, the only situation where the optimal solution occurs at an interior point is a situation where the gradient is equal to zero, because that's the criteria for an optimal solution to occur at an interior point. And we saw earlier the only time that's going to happen is if the function was constant, which means that um, the optimal solution occurs everywhere, at every interior point, at every edge point, and at every vertex. And then there's this issue here, which is if um, the optimal solution atta is attained at some point along an edge, so here's an edge, if the optimal solution happens here, I have to be able to show that it also happens at some vertex, because I said it will always happen at a vertex. What if it happens on the boundary but not at a vertex? It turns out in this case, um, we can justify that pretty easily, why this will never occur, why there'll never be a case where the maximum is in the middle of an edge, but not also at one of the vertices at the other end of the edge. Um, I have an example to demonstrate that, but I can, I can describe the intuition behind it. So basically, if I have my edge again here, and suppose I'm sitting at this point, the question is, can I make the function any bigger by walking somewhere else? Well, what are the options? If the gradient of f points this way, then I can walk this way along the line to make my uh, objective function bigger. Okay, in which case I get to this vertex. Um, if the gradient points this way, then same story but opposite direction. I can walk this way along the line and this vertex will have a larger value than the, than the x. If the gradient points up, so if the gradient points away from the line, in other words, if the gradient is orthogonal to my line, then walking this way won't increase the function value, and walking this way won't increase the function value because both of these directions are orthogonal to my gradient. On the other hand, walking in either direction won't decrease the function value either, which means, in fact, if the gradient is perpendicular to my edge, every point along the edge has the same objective value. In which case, so does the vertex at the end. And so it turns out we won't have that situation. I do have a brief demonstration of that as well um, uh, with, with a diagram. So here is the same uh, example as earlier, but with a different objective function. So the gradient here is 1, 1. But it's the same feasible region. Okay, we'll try, oh, whoops, no it isn't. 
Um, yep, sorry. First constraints, all, I should have read the slide. First constraint is also different. I did this because I wanted to make the diagram a little bit easier to read. So uh, I'm going to start at the same feasible point that I did before. I'm going to keep walking. So I keep walking until I hit the boundary. Now I'm sitting at the boundary. It turns out if we look carefully at the, these new constraints, so the gradient of f of my objective function is 1, 1. The normal vector of this constraint, which is the gradient of the constraint, equals also 1, 1. In other words, it looks a lot, because this, this is um, perpendicular to the line, it looks a lot like f, the gradient of f, will be perpendicular to the line. And so I end up on this constraint here. Uh, and the gradient of f points is 1, 1, so it points this way. The, the normal vector of the line is actually parallel to that. It points in exactly the same direction. Uh, and so uh, by the KKT conditions, interestingly, it's saying this is an optimal solution because the gradient and, uh, of f and the normal vector of the, of the constraint are the same or point in the same direction. If I were to project the gradient of f onto the line, I'm going to get the zero vector because f is perpendicular to this line. What that's telling us, though, is that if I move along the line, I am not either increasing or decreasing the value of f. So if I, if I want to, I could move all the way down to a vertex on the line, and I wouldn't change the objective value, which means the objective value at each vertex nearby is the same as the objective value here. So even though this point is indeed the maximum, so is every other point uh, along the line. So every point along this line segment is the maximum solution. So claim two still holds. I still uh, attain the maximum at a vertex. Um, and if I look at the contour plot of that, you can see um, that, the, the well, the color doesn't change. But notice how the line is parallel to the contour line nearby. So there's my pictorial justification uh, of that subcase of claim two.